welcome everybody for today's IHF Skills for All session. As you know, the topic of the day is Science of Fun. I think we all know the Zoom etiquette by now, so keep your microphone muted until you want to say something. As you know, if you have questions, you can use the chat box. And after today's presentation, we have a Q&A session in which you can also use the raise hand option. We kindly request you to turn on your camera. Thanks for your cooperation. So one of the key questions we work with in our Learn to Play program, as you might know, is do you think or do you know? So what is the science or the expertise or the knowledge behind the programs we run? And if we don't know, how to look for solutions and answers? But sometimes we take terms for granted and we think we know. I think fun is one of these words. Often we are preaching all activities need to be fun for players, but what does that really mean? And, and how do we do that? I see often hitting uh, little kids each other on the head with a stick. And that seems a lot of fun for some of my underrates while they are standing in line. And in various uh, of our feedback sessions or evaluation sessions with coaches, coaches make this remark like, oh, this drill was so boring. While what we see on ice, the kids were excited and having a big smile on their face. So very often, um, the perception or, or, of fun might be different between children and adults. So it's time to learn more about fun. And with great pleasure, we introduce today's speaker who did an extended study about fun and is willing to share her knowledge. Welcome, Heather Mannix, and thank you for accepting our invite to present. Heather is USA Hockey ADM Manager Female Hockey and a Master in Science of Fun. And she describes herself on Twitter, she lives to understand, facilitate, and enhance fun in youth hockey. Heather, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Johan, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and transition over and get this started. Just give me one moment so I can get it all set up for you. All right. So as Johan mentioned, um, we are, will be talking about the science of fun today. And this is something that I've spent uh, you know, about six, seven years really working on and, and bringing back to the community from which it was developed from. And so what my job is with USA Hockey, I am the uh, ADM manager for female hockey. So what I do is I actually work a lot with our local clubs, um, helping them to implement our American development model. And so before I started with USA Hockey, uh, I was able to work on this study that, that we deemed the fun integration theory. And so I was at the George Washington University and I was lucky enough to have a mentor, uh, Dr. Amanda Visick, who this was her study. And this was a NIH funded study. So our government funded this study, which was a really big deal in America because our government doesn't typically fund uh, youth sport research very often. And so the fact that they, they deemed this as, it's important really kind of spoke to the credence of, of why we needed this information. And so from this study, we were able to publish several papers uh, on, on our findings. And so we had our, our first paper was really was the background on the fun integration theory. And then we had, um, we looked at the differences or perceived differences between adults, so coaches and parents and players. And then we looked at differences and similarities between, between actual players. So um, younger kids, older kids, um, and, you know, kids that played in different levels. And so when we think about, and we also did um, a, a uh, book chapter for sports psychology for youth athletes that really took a more applied focus. So it took that, that science research and put it into more of an application base for, for coaches to then take it out and actually use in the, uh, the field. And we've also worked with the Swedish Ice Hockey Federation that um, has taken this this research and implemented it into not only into their coaching education program, but they're also doing a study of their own, looking at um, you know 
how much fun or how fun each one of these determinants are ranked by their, their players. And so it's going to be some really interesting findings to see what, if any, cultural differences do exist. Um, and, you know, our, our hypotheses based on the, the previous, you know, there's been decades of research that go back into motivation and what motivates our players. Um, we think that the, the findings are going to be very similar, but we're, we're really, really excited to, uh, to see what comes out of this. And so this research not only is being integrated into the Swedish Ice Hockey Federation, but we're also implementing it into our own American development model. And so um, our coaching education program has really started to, to take this research and, and integrate it in a way that will help our coaches understand how do we create this experience for kids on the ice? Because at the end of the day, like Johan uh, mentioned, it's really, it is, it's one of those, uh, those situations where, you know, we want to make it fun. Everybody knows that it's very important that we, we make it fun for the kids but what is fun? And that was the big question that Amanda faced when she started this research project. And so what we know about fun is that it's the number one reason why kids participate in sports, right? Which that makes sense. It's, if it's not fun, they don't want to do it. And, but we have this, it's very, um, it's a very like emotive, elusive kind of abstract concept that it really wasn't concretely defined you know when you're having it, right? But you don't, and you also know when you're not having it. But as adults, how do we create that experience? And that's why we really needed to understand what were the kids, what were the kids telling us is fun? So we know how to create that experience. But we do know that, um, and especially if you work with any kind of uh, higher track or, or more elite um, coaches, we have a fear when we talk about fun. Um, we have a fear that if we just let our kids just go out there and have fun, that you're going to get this kid, right? Or you're going to get kids doing this, or you're going to have the dancing goalie, right? If we just let our kids just go out there and just have fun, this isn't going to help them become better hockey players. This isn't going to help me as a coach win more games. We can't just let them go out there and have fun because they're not going to learn how to play hockey. They may get very good at their pirouettes, uh, as, as Scully was. Um, but how are they? How is just having fun going to let them? Going to help them become better hockey players? And one of the reasons why we think that as adults is that we have we have common misconceptions about what fun actually is. And so a few of the common myths are that fun is, is synonymous or it's the same as goofing off, or it's really important for the young kids, but as they get older, it's, it's serious and we're here to work, we're not here to have fun, right? So those are kind of some of the, the myths that we as adults think about when we, when we first hear the word fun. Or, that fun is mutually exclusive from athlete development, right? So if they're out there just having fun, then that's not helping them develop. If they're out there really working hard and, and, and developing, that's probably not fun for them. So that's what we typically think about as adults when we think about fun is that these are two separate things from one another. If we want them working hard, then they're probably not having fun. If they're, having if they're having fun, they're probably not working as hard as they could be. So this is where the, the, you know, the big question comes in is how do you actually define this abstract concept that is fun? And so youth sports is very um, unique in the sense that it is, it is us adults that are responsible for creating the environment that kids are then supposed to play within, right? So we as adults have to create this environment, but how often do we ask the kids what it is that they want out of this environment? And so that's where, if you think about a lot of the, the major successful companies, they're constantly asking their consumers, you know, how do they, how do you like this experience? What could make it better? They're, they're constantly trying to get that feedback from their consumers, knowing that if they keep a pulse on what the consumers want, they're going to continue to bring those consumers back, 
And so when we think about youth sports, we have to think about if we are asking the kids what it is that they want and are we providing that for them? If we want to continue to have them coming back to the greatest game on earth, right? And so that's what Amanda did. She created this study that we, it was a brainstorm, it was a three-step process. And the first process, the first step was we asked players, parents, and coaches to define everything that they could think of that made playing sports fun. So for the little kids, this meant a, a clipboard with a piece of paper with this sentence at the top. And we said, finish this sentence. So one thing that makes playing sports fun for players is, and we had them list everything they could think of, right? So this was in a soccer community, but to make sure that it wasn't soccer specific, we asked them, how many of you play more than one team sport or something other than soccer? And 75% of the kids, over 75% of the kids said that they played more than one team sport. And so we said, that's perfect because we didn't want it to be just specific to soccer. We wanted it to be generalizable across team sports. And so we said, when, when you are answering this, we want you to think about when you're playing football, when you're playing soccer, sorry, soccer and football and American football, American soccer. I realized that uh, we're the only ones that mix those up. Uh, when you're playing hockey, when you're playing lacrosse, think of all of those things, everything that goes into to, to making sports fun for you and list them out. And so we obviously had thousands of statements and we had to synthesize them down. And what we normally see when we think about fun, right? Again, it goes back to talking and goofing off with your teammates or winning, right? Like it's, it's all about winning. That's when we have the most fun. But what we were really surprised to see was that they identified 81 specific actions and behaviors that defined this one word this three letter word. So they did such a great job of really parceling out and, and finding all of the things that make playing sports fun for them. And so if you see, in, and you don't have to, you'll get, you'll get a, a PDF with all of this, so you don't have to memorize all of these, but I want you to take notice of, of a few of the ones that, that, may, that may seem a little out of place if you do believe that fun is synonymous with goofing off. And so you'll notice that they, they identified working hard, competing, doing small partner, small uh, partner and group drills, scrimmaging during practice, learning new skills, learning from mistakes, right? So they identified all of these different things and said, this is what makes up this, this fun experience for us. And so for the first time, we have an operational definition of what is fun for kids. And so what we did is after they, they identified all of these 81 determinants, we said, you guys did such a great job identifying these things. Now we need you to help us understand how do they all fit together? And so we asked them to organize them in a way that just categorize them in a way that made sense to them. And so what we found was that they actually identified the 81 determinants they organized them into 11 fun factors or 11 categories. And so you'll notice here that we, we named them trying hard, positive team dynamics, positive coaching, learning and improving games and practices. And there's a few more that'll come on the next slide, but I do wanna highlight a couple of those determinants again, just to drive home the fact that it's really not this goofing off that is, that is uh, what makes this experience fun for kids. They have things like trying hard and or trying your best and competing. They have things like being challenged to improve and get better at your sport and learning from mistakes. Okay. And as we continue going forward, they also identified team friendships, mental bonuses, game time support, team rituals, and swag because you have to have cool gear, right? If you want to have fun. And so what this, what this information did is it really, it created these robust three-dimensional scientific blueprints of what makes playing sports fun for kids. So this is like the framework or the foundation that we as coaches can then use to help build this experience for our kids. And what we started to notice was that there were four general areas or four sources of fun 
that started to, to, uh, to arise when we were looking at the data. And so we have the context specific aspects of fun, right? So we have games and practices and the determinants that make games and practices fun for our kids. We have the internal sources of fun, which really drive that intrinsic motivation. So that trying hard, that learning and improving those mental bonuses that they get from, from sport. And when it comes to motivation, this is the really important stuff that we need to, as adults, understand. There's obviously the social sources of fun. So having those positive team dynamics, that good team chemistry, right? And those team friendships outside of the sport and also experiencing those team rituals that, that every team seems to have. And then the external sources of fun, which are positive coaching. So the impact that our coaches and our parents with game time support also have on the experience. And then our swag, which are kind of those tournaments and, and, uh, and being able to stay in hotels and things like that. And so what we did was we, we looked at when we ranked the, the fund determinants one through 81 as the most important to the least important, what we found was the top 20 determinants. If you take a look at these, you'll start to notice that these are very process oriented determinants. So these are things that are not necessarily, if we're focused on the outcome, we're going to miss a lot of these opportunities to create the fun experience for kids. So when we think about what is the most important to fun in creating this experience for kids, you'll notice that there's one determinant on this list that we as adults often get caught up with that kids didn't really identify as the most important. And so typically when we have, when I'm in person and we're having these conversations, they're a little bit more interactive, but if some of you haven't noticed, winning isn't on this top 20 list, all right? And that's not to say that winning isn't fun. It absolutely is fun. It is a very fun experience, but it is not the most important thing when it comes to creating that fun experience for kids. They want opportunities to work hard. They want opportunities to compete. They want to learn and get better at, these, at, the, at the skills that are absolutely necessary for them to be able to compete in hockey, right? And so when we as adults are thinking about how do we create this experience, we need to understand what is important to emphasize, what is important to reinforce the good behaviors and what is less important that we sometimes find ourselves focusing too much of our attention or placing too much importance on as adults? And so one of the things that we wanted to do when we structured this study was we wanted to make sure that we had equal representation of girls and boys, of kids that played more recreational level sports and kids that played more elite travel sports, and then younger kids, which were U9, to U13 and older kids, which were U14 to U19, okay? And so when we did that, the reason why we did this, we wanted to look at, are there similarities? Are there differences between these groups of kids? Oftentimes we get that, you know, girls want to play sports uh, because they want to be around their friends, but boys play sports because they want to compete. They want to get better. And there's a sense of mastery. So we wanted to investigate, were those actually true when it comes to creating the, the, the fun experience for, for these kids? And what we found was when we did all of these comparisons, so we did about 30, no, I think we did over 50 comparisons of subgroups, right? So girls compared to boys, rec compared to travel, younger, older. We even did as far as like younger girls that were playing rec versus younger boys that were playing rec. So we did all sorts of different comparisons with these groups and we found what stayed consistent across all of the different groups was that the most important factors of fun were trying hard, positive team dynamics and positive coaching. Whether you were a girl playing sports, whether you're a boy, whether you're a younger kid or older kid, whether you played recreational or whether you were more competitive elite track, trying hard, positive team dynamics and positive coaching remained the most important factors for creating this fun experience. Well, secondary was learning and improving, which was always a very close 
very close set on uh, number four. So we always say the top four were pretty much the top four um, across, but it, it varied just a little bit with some of the groups. But learning and improving games, practices, team friendships, mental bonuses, and game time support were kind of in that second tier of importance. And then that third tier of importance, team rituals and swag always fell at the bottom. And again, that's not to say that those things are not important. It's just less important when compared to all of the other uh, factors and, and determinants. And so we were really surprised to see how similar our young athletes were when we were expecting to see lots of big differences and there really wasn't any differences. And so as, as, as we sat there and looked at this data, we thought, okay, not what we expected, um, but what does this actually mean in real life? And we thought this is actually a really good thing for coaches because oftentimes you're coaching more than one team, right? So you may be coaching a girls team and a boys team. You may be coaching you know, our, a lot of coaches, uh, you know, are coaching their, their youngest kid and their oldest kid, right? And so when we have these, these different teams that we're coaching, sometimes we, we try to, we coach girls differently than boys. We coach younger kids differently than older kids. Um, and not to say that it doesn't look different, but the underlying principle remains the same. So when I look at trying hard, trying hard for an eight-year-old is going to look different than trying hard for a 16-year-old. So what that actually looks like on the ice for an eight-year-old might be a game of tag or sharks and minnows, right? For a 16-year-old, it may be a battle drill in the corner. It's that, so how are we creating the environment that supports what our kids are saying that they want? How do we create an environment that allows them to try hard, that allows for those positive team dynamics to be built all the while we as coaches are trying to make sure that we're, we're putting in that positive spin. What was very interesting though, and this is something that um, goes back to our first slides, is that what coaches believed were fun and what the kids were actually saying ended up being pretty different. At the younger ages, so when we compared younger kids, so again, it's that U9 to U13 range to coaches of younger kids, their perceptions were actually pretty similar to one another. But as they got older, so when we compared older kids to coaches of older kids, that's where we started to see this big disconnect happen between what coaches perceived was fun and what the kids were actually saying was fun. And the biggest, the biggest disconnect came from that trying hard, the, that trying hard factor, where older kids rated it as the most important to creating their fun experience. Coaches rated it as sixth. So we always think, and I, I kind of joke about how, um, you know, as a coach, you may be thinking, you know, trying hard there's no way that my kids are telling me that trying hard is the most important thing to fund. I can't get them to give me any kind of effort out there. I'm yelling at them. I'm screaming at them. I'm chasing them around the ice and banging my stick just for them to give me some effort. And so there's no way that my kids would say trying hard is the most important thing to fund. But in all reality, and what I have a couple of clips here to kind of show you the difference of how we as coaches and as adults can create an environment where kids want to try hard. It's not that they don't want to try hard. Sometimes it's just, we haven't created the environment that incentivizes them to try hard, okay? And so that's what I kind of want you guys to think about is, you know, the big takeaways of this, uh, of this presentation is that, you know, fun is not mutually exclusive from athlete development. And we as adults have a huge opportunity and responsibility to create an environment that incentivizes kids to do what we want them to do. And so I have a couple of examples here where um, in some local clubs in the US uh, and some just some differences that I want you to, um, to identify, right? So this is a very common drill. Um, I did it as a kid. I did it, I ran my, my kids through it when I was a young coach and looking back, I, you know, it's not something that I, I would do knowing what I know now. So this is an example of 
a very simple drill, but if you watch the kid's effort, that's what I want you to keep an eye on. And so the skills or the, the technique that the coaches are working on here are stops and starts, transitions, forwards to backwards, right? But if you notice the kids are kind of going through the motions and if they are trying hard, it's typically because of that external motivation, right? So they don't want to get yelled at, they don't want to get screamed at, they don't wanna get chased by the coach banging their stick on the ice. But there really isn't a whole lot of, decision making there's not any there's not very much there's no compete level they they can in a drill like this go through the motions okay and so when you think about what fun determinants are actually being fostered and facilitated in this type of an environment we can say well they're exercising and being active and they're getting and staying in shape arguably if they are putting enough effort to kind of tax their cardiovascular system and so just to kind of explain, because I skipped over this, trying hard and learning and improving, these are all of the determinants that define these two factors. And so as we go through these videos, I want you to just look at the, the determinants and try to line up and see, okay, which ones are actually being worked on here? Which ones does this environment incentivize? So you look at a drill like this, and then you compare it to something like this. And so when you think about the, the, the technical abilities that, that a coach is focusing on in this type of a drill, it's a lot of stops and starts. It's a lot of transitions, right? It's very similar to the technique or the technical ability that they're working on in the other drill. I was at both of these practices, and I can tell you that the girls in this clip are having way more fun than the girls in the other clip. When you look at what are the, the fun determinants that are being fostered in this type of an environment, right? They're trying way, way more than they were in the other one because there's a competition level. We've made it a game and now the kids want to compete. So as soon as you make something a game, all of a sudden their competition level goes up, right? Their compete level goes up they automatically start working harder because they want to compete. They're being challenged way more than, than they are in, in a traditional drill. They're learning from mistakes. If you lose the puck in this drill, you have to figure out a way to get it back, right? But it's not a, it's not a pre-scripted, predetermined path that they have to follow. It's a lot of decision-making. It's a lot of keeping your head up. It's a lot of reading and reacting all in a game. And when you, as soon as you make it a game, it becomes more fun and they automatically start trying harder. And so this is another example, something that we see all over, all over the US, uh, probably all over the world as well, our five on O breakout. Again, I want you to watch the effort in these kids and as they go through the motions here. And so what we know as well is that fun is, is the key that unlocks learning. When kids are having fun, they are competing, they are trying hard. And if we set up the environment that is realistic, then they're going to, those skills that are learned in those environments are way more transferable to the actual game. Oftentimes we run drills like this as coaches and as adults, we think that activities that mimic an ideal version of a breakout or an ideal version of something that we want to see on the ice, oftentimes that doesn't necessarily, mimicking what the game, the ideal version of the game doesn't necessarily teach the game. And in fact, it doesn't. There's a lot of research on skill acquisition that shows that you really need to put the kids in game-like environments. And this is not a game-like environment. What we notice though, is that they're exercising and being active, they're getting and staying in shape. And if you did notice as you, as this kind of plays through, the only time there was conflict in this drill was accidental when the kids were coming off of the bench to start the new, uh, the new 
the new set. And the only time there was conflict, they actually don't get the puck out of the, their zone. Yep, right there. <laughs> so when we think about our kids, we can't get them to, to run a, a breakout effectively, but if this is how we're practicing our breakouts in practice, we're not setting them up for success. And this is really not very fun for them. You compare that to a more competitive game, right? In a more, um, a, a more realistic game-like example, there's going to be more mistakes. It's going to look very chaotic, but again, we know that learning is messy. Kids in this drill are having way more fun and watch the effort. Oh, make a mistake, get it back. But if you watch our defense here, now they have to evade, they have to find an open pass and look at the effort, the difference compared to that five on O really um, ideal version of a breakout. So when we think about what are the fun determinants that are being fostered and facilitated in an environment like this, again, we're hitting on way more. Whenever we make it more game-like, whenever we make more decision-making in our, in our drills and in our environments, that's what's, that's what's driving that fun factor. And that's what's driving that, that desire to want to compete and that desire to want to try hard. So this is something that is it's seen at all levels from the from the 6U to the to 16U. We have to create an environment that is a game like environment that is fun for the kids to participate in. And once we do that, they're going to try harder. They're going to compete and they're going to have more fun. And so what we talk about in the U.S. and with USA Hockey is these five elements of a good practice design. So we obviously, we want our practices, all of our practices to be fun. And what we know now from our operational definition of fun, all of these other elements are actually components of fun. And so when you create an environment that has a lot of decision-making for kids, they're challenging not just your best players and not your, just your worst players, but you're, you're finding a way to challenge every one of your players optimally it looks something like the game, right? So there's a, there's a transferability factor that is, again, you have those decision makings, you have the decisions being made, you have that challenge that you would see in a game, so pressure, things like that. And you're also getting a lot of puck touches or repetitions without repetitiveness. And so puck touches, when we say that, a, it's not just only a fun determinant is getting, you know, getting, having opportunity to, to play with the puck on your stick. So as it, with the younger kids, it may actually mean just having a puck on their stick as much as possible, right? Getting them comfortable with doing all of the, all of the different skills and abilities with the puck on their stick. That, that could be puck touches there. If there are older kids, it's, we're really looking at repetitions without repetitiveness. So how do we create repetitions of uh, puck retrievals, repetitions of finding open space, repetitions of communicating with our with your teammates, right? So all of those repetitions are just a little bit different in the game. And the more that we can create these um, realistic and non predetermined pathways in our in our drills, that is going to help with those those repetitions without have, being super repetitive. Again, when we implement all of these elements, when you look at your practice design, if you can look at and, and include all of these elements, you're going to have a much more fun environment for your kids. And so just to, to wrap this up, um, we have a couple of quotes here from, we had uh, John Hines, who is a NHL coach, um, is, but is coached all the way, you know, multiple different levels and including at our, our national uh, team development program. And so from a development standpoint, He's, he's had, he's, he's coached the wide spectrum of, of uh, players at different levels. And so he actually uh, was on our, one of our webinars and he was discussing a difference between practices for maintenance and practices for development. And to my knowledge, he hasn't heard anything about this, uh, the research that the, the fun maps research, but what I found was really cool was that by just him speaking about the difference between practices for maintenance and practices for development, he was tying in all of these different fund determinants. Okay. And so 
when he was talking about practices for maintenance, he said, these are your five on O drills, your flow drills, they're the drills that basically get the blood flowing. The players are able to feel the puck and they're not too hard, but they're doing nothing for development. And so when you think about at the NHL level, and this is something that happens very often in, in America is that um, our, our NHL teams often have open practices. So coaches can, you know, either go and watch their practices or they can watch them, you know, now with YouTube and Instagram and Twitter, they can see what practices these NHL teams are running. And so they see these drills that NHL teams are running in season, but they don't take into consideration that they're an 82 game season. They travel if players that have been playing at the highest level for years and years, they have to do these flow drills um, where there really isn't a whole lot of decision just to maintain and get them ready for the next game. And so coaches in America, they see these drills and they take them back to their, to their young kids and say, well, I mean, I saw, you know, Blashell at the Red Wings, you know, doing this drill, this must be a good drill. We're going to do it with our kids. But knowing that, not knowing that it's really not developing our players and those flow drills are not fun. And later on, um, you know, he actually mentioned that he hates practices for maintenance because they're just not that fun for players or coaches. But when you talk about practices for development, that's where you're putting on a heavy emphasis on the pace at which you practice. You're putting them in situations where they have to think the game. There's multiple pucks in certain drills. They're game-like situations those areas where you're practicing with your players, you're improving. So just by talking about development, he really was starting to identify a lot of the things that kids identified were fun, right? They wanna be put in those game-like situations. They want to compete, that's fun. And so when you think about fun, we really wanna to start to tie in the fact that fun is development and development when it's done correctly is fun. And so, this really to drive home that, that fun isn't just important for our six U's and our eight U's and our 10 U's, right? It has to be fun at the highest levels if we want to get our players to be able to perform at the highest level that there is. And so I did this presentation um, for our girls and women's section in our USA Hockey um, uh, summer meetings. And we had a couple of Olympic athletes uh, on the call that are a part of our section. And so, oh, yep. And so we had Megan Duggan, who is our former women's uh, national team captain on the call. And after I did this presentation, they started to talk about their experience as players and as coaches. And so I just wanted to show you just a quick video um, and, uh, and see how this goes. I just kind of touched on it at the end. Um, I coached for two seasons at Clarkson University and one of the biggest things that that we always talked about or that I noticed in my players was um, those battle days, those competition days where they had to work hard and yes it was like arguably probably some of our toughest practices but they ended up having the most fun, always wanting to revisit those days um, because of the pride sense of competing as a team, kind of what you get through during those tough battle days. And, you know, those would be without question, our hardest physically practices that you would think, you know, they would hate that, but the competition and the battle days and the work hard concept, um, was easily our, you know, when they had the most fun and they took a lot of pride in those practices and where we saw the most growth as a team, um, from a, you know, on ice performance standpoint, but also, you know, from a camaraderie standpoint or, um, you know, just a team bonding or things like that. And I can say as a player too, and, um, you know, while winning or losing those competition days or those battle days and the national team practices can really set the tone for the rest of the week. Um, I, I would say the same about, um, you know, as a player, I mean, those battle days really as, as difficult as they are, um, or those hard work days, they're, they're fun too. And I think they, they bring the team together a lot. So it's just my two cents on that too. So really to, like I said, to drive home here, um, when we think about fun, we, I really want you to walk away with the fact that if you're creating a fun experience for your kids and a fun environment for your kids, they are going to be developing. And if you're doing development right, they are going to have fun. 
And so hopefully you found this informative. If you have any questions, I would love to take them. Uh, if you would like more information, if you take a picture of that QR code, um, that links you to a video of Amanda talking about the research in a little bit more depth. Uh, on Twitter, anytime that we have a, any new um, research coming out, we usually use the hashtags fun integration theory, fun maps, and then my information. If you have any questions um, that we don't get to today, please feel free to, um, to reach out to me. And I love to have these conversations with, uh, with people. So enjoy any, uh, any. Thank you, Heather. Uh, we open the floor. If there is any questions, you can raise your hand or just uh, use the chat. It's up to you. Any questions? Let's unlock the burning. It's fun, said Amanda, so uh, said Heather. So any questions? The good news is that if I look at your top four, trying hard, positive team dynamics and positive coaching, and number four, learning and improving, it is, it is the first, it is all elements you need in cognitive development. So it is, it is really good news because that's, that's all elements you would need if you really want your kids to make progress and develop in a cognitive way. Absolutely. And, uh, and Johanny, bring up a very good point. This is something that we, uh, we realized after we uh, stepped back and look at, looked at all of the fun determinants, we started to realize that they identified um, components of different motivational theories. Um, so self-determination theory, uh, achievement goal theory, um, the four C's of coaching. So these kids, a lot of times with research, it's done from a top down where we have these theories that we want to, we, we make hypotheses for and we test them on a specific environment to see if they, if we were correct. But with the way that Amanda structured this study, it was really a grassroots approach. So the, the, the actual stakeholders, the players, the parents, the coaches were the ones that defined what made playing sports fun rather than researchers defining what they think is fun and then testing to see if they were right. So it really was a grassroots approach to understanding fun. And by doing it that way, they actually identified, you know, all of these different uh, components of motivational theories and, um, you know, skill acquisition theories that have been well established in the research for decades and uh, and studied for decades. So it was really cool to kind of see that that grassroots approach um, development and really confirming a lot of uh, research that's been done already. There is another question. After all these facts on how can you create the drills that make the practice more fun? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that the, the five elements that, that uh, USA Hockey has come up with, and I know they're similar to, um, I think uh, it might be rugby in UK uh, has the, the golden ribbon or the golden thread. Um, they're, they're very similar. It's, it's really about taking a look at your practice and, and your practice plans and asking yourself, um, is there real life decisions being made? Or are the kids doing what I've told them to do? Have I told them to skate around this cone, skate around this cone, skate around this cone, and then shoot when they get here? Because as soon as I've done that, where I've told them where to go and what to do, I've taken away the decisions being made. And so, you know, even just replacing cones with players, right? So a player stands there. That's one way to progress that drill. A player stands there instead of a cone and moves their stick from one side to the other. And the player with the puck has to decide which way to go, depending on which way the stick is, right? So now you've added a decision-making component to it. If you can add a competition component, right? So anytime there's a race for a puck or um, anytime there is, if you put something on the line, like, you know, uh, whoever, you know, whoever gets stick on puck, you know, every time there's a stick on puck situation. So anytime that my defenseman gets a stick on, on, your, on your puck of the opponent, they get a point, right? So now we've made a game out of it. And so we're teaching a habit of stick on puck, which is a good defensive habit. And we're giving, we're incentivizing it with a point within a game. 
So we can be playing a, a 3v3 cross ice game, but we're incentivizing a specific habit that we want to coach and teach in that environment. So if that is stick on puck, it's all right, we're playing 3v3, but every time that your team gets stick on puck, you get an extra point, right? So now it's a game within the game. And so anytime that you can incentivize the behaviors rather than, you know, if you think about it this way as well, how many times as coaches do we yell at our kids in practice, get your head up, get your head up, get your head up, right? Well, if we construct the environment that forces them to get their head up, so you think about that one video of all of the kids skating around, uh, you know, trying to keep the puck away from their other partner, that forces their kids to get the head, up, get their head up. As a coach, I don't have to yell at my kids to get their head up because I've already created the environment that's incentivizing them to do what I want them to do. And so, again, when it comes to you know driving that internal motivation and incentivizing kids to do what you want them to do, rather than yelling at them or telling them to do it over and over, the body doesn't care what the coach is telling them right? The body does what the mind is telling it to do. And so if you're forcing your kids to make decisions, the body is going to respond. If you've created an environment where they have to keep their head up, you don't have to yell at them to keep their head up. You've already created the environment. And again, anytime you create a competition, um, it really, it makes it more fun. So I hope that answered that question. Thank you, Amanda. Um... Then the question was asked, does it include off ice or only on ice as fun practice? Oh, that's a great question. This is really transferable. It's not even just in sport. And that's where the, uh, you know, I've had many people come up to me um, after doing this presentation and asking, you know, have you done a fun maps for, you know, like a corporate jobs, uh, the work environment, the adult work environment? I mean, the these determinants really transfer to a lot of different areas of life, um, but absolutely off ice as well. And so when you think about, you know, how are you warming your kids up, play games, right? It's, you know, getting their body and getting their mind ready to play hockey. And so the, the off ice component, absolutely. I, you know, you start, you start playing games with them off ice. Now, all of a sudden, they're not just getting their body ready, but you're also getting their mind ready to start making quick decisions. Thank you, Amanda. I think really important, and, and we call it constraint-led approach, the environment is really important because if you don't create that environment, it will not happen. And uh, the Curver method, which was developed in the 1970s, which was exactly the linear system of no decision making, just repetition on skills is not what, what, what we see as a development environment today. So I really think that, and, I'm, and uh, Heather mentioned it a couple of times, it's about creating the environment and, and now coaches should be very active to, to involve thinking and executing um, in, in the same game or game-like situation. So I have a question can I, yeah, you can unmute. Let me see. We have a question for uh, Farzat. Let me see if I can unmute you. Here you go, sir. Uh, all right. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, and thank you for having us. Uh, I'm Farzat from Iran. Uh, and my question is a little bit complicated. We, you know, we, we work with kids uh, for like, five, six years, after a while, they get used to having fun all the time. So higher levels, and you want to practice with them more serious. So uh, that, 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 was, that, that was always a challenge for me. Farzat, is it possible to type in your question? We lost you. Anybody else? Another question? We will just check if Farzat is coming back or he can type his question in the chat. And and I can kind of touch a little bit on, on what he said if, 
while anybody thinks of any other questions that they may have, but the, if I if I understood the direction that he was going, is that you know at a certain point you have to be um, uh, you have to be a little bit more serious or hold them uh, more accountable to to specific actions um, within practice, and and I absolutely I, I believe that that's that's the case, right? So once you get to a certain level, there is there is a level of dedication that has to happen both on and off the ice to play at the highest levels of your sport. And so, but when it comes to incentivizing the behaviors that you want, it's again, it's um, there are ways to do it in a competitive fashion where you are, you are pushing your kids to try harder than they, they, they ever have before. And it's going to be uncomfortable in certain situations. And so it's really about just figuring out what drives that internal motivation. And so there may be some individual differences between, between players. And that's where getting to know your players is really important. How can you push, you know, again, on a, on a team, you're going to have a wide range of personalities and understanding what motivates, you know, this person compared to what motivates this person may be a little bit different. But the more, um, the more of a rapport and more of a relationship you have with each one of your players, the more you know how to incentivize, how to push, you know, can you, can you push this player just a little bit harder? Can you push them just a little harder out of their comfort zone? Or, you know, if you do the same thing with another player, they may shut down completely. So it's really about figuring out your players, what motivates them and how, how to push them as, as a coach. Okay, thank you, Amanda. We have a question from Anna. Can we unmute Anna, please? Absolutely. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm Anna. I'm from Brazil. I'm with Salvador in this call. And my question is about how uh, this having fun thing factors into recruiting youth players, like mostly little kids. So um, what I was thinking was, you know, people like young kids that are pre pre development, I would even call it like, if you can even go as far as that, but um, how would you get little kids to have fun before they're bettering themselves in that sport, you know, before they even know how to skate and things like that. I can see that happening at, at the stage where kids um, start having drills and start keeping their heads up. But, you know, in Brazil, we deal with the, a lot of our problem is due to the fact that we have a very limited number of players and we want to focus our efforts into getting more kids to enjoy the game. How do we do that at the first and foremost, like most primeval state mm -hmm. is my question, I guess. That's a great question, Anna. And, uh, and so there's a couple of ways that I would address it. So first, I, I think that um, getting kids, you know, comfortable and interested with, with hockey off the ice is one avenue of doing it, right? So you have the, the floorball option where, you know, they're running around and, and just their, their shoes on, on, on a floor. They don't have to learn the actual, um, uh, the technical ability to skate, to start to enjoy aspects of the game. But once they get on the ice, I mean, it is, that's where it's the most important for, for those kids at that stage to have fun. And I think that, you know, it traditionally, it was, I know when I learned to skate, um, they gave me a cone or, you know, a chair, even though I only had it for one practice. And I always tell my brother that he had to use that for like, at least, you know, like two or three weeks to learn how to skate, but I figured it out on after only one, but Nowadays, it is it is less structured, right? Where okay, you can give them something to to stand up with, but as long as they have some kind of, I'm a big proponent of you. If you can give them some kind of pads to cover their knees or their elbows, so when they fall, it doesn't hurt. Um, that is, I think, a, a big a big proponent of, of making it more fun because once they once they fall and recognize that it doesn't hurt, then you can see falling is fun. Right now you can do drills where they can, you know, take a couple of steps and fall and now they have to learn how to get up. And so it's really just learning, though, that that agility, balance, coordination, those ABCs of moving, uh, learning to move on the ice. That's where, you know, playing games like hiding things under cones, 
right? So I've seen where you, you have a bunch of different cones in the, the circle and they, you have a ball or a puck underneath the cone. They have to skate over, pick the, the cone up, grab it, and then bring it over to a net, right? So now you've made a game that it, you're not telling them what to do. You're not telling them, you know, this, you know, put your skate here and then push out, put your skate here and then push out. It's just really just getting them into a game environment where they are just figuring out how to move. So I think that, you know, again, it's just, it's, it's creating, creating the, the opportunity to develop within a game uh, makes, makes that experience so much more fun for kids. And I, like I said, making it so that falling isn't a scary thing, but falling and sliding is fun. Um, that's one way. And I think that, you know, Johan, and I know, you know, if you have anything to add on that, um, feel free. I know that you guys do a lot of programming with the learn to play. We have two more questions. So first question is, are the kids getting rest during summer or they practice all year? Uh, we're big proponents of them playing other sports, uh, from a physical literacy standpoint, right? So having a, a wide movement vocabulary is the best way to create athletes and resilient athletes. Um, so not playing hockey year round is, is what we tell kids and what we tell parents is we want them to, we want them to go out and play, uh, play soccer. We want them to go out and play other sports. Um, cause that's going to add to their, their movement vocabulary. It's going to add to their, their movement skills. And it's ultimately going to make them better hockey players than if they only focused on, on improving hockey skills year round. Exactly. We have to focus on the, on the process, not the result. And Kevin would always say, uh, focus on, on, the, on the root, not on the fruit. Um, so it's very important that we enhance multi-sport, especially in the young age, uh, because it's not a sprint, it's a development, is a marathon. So I think the next question is a good question and it, it, it will answer itself. Do, you, do we believe that we need to educate our coaches on how to make practices fun? on the way you showed it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that anytime knowledge is power, right? And whenever we, whenever we can educate ourselves and learn, uh, you know, the best ways to create the most optimal development experiences, not just physical development, but cognitive development and emotional development, social development. Um, I absolutely think that if we can educate ourselves as coaches, we can create that environment for our kids. And once we do that, it's going to be more fun. And so I, I say that the roadmap to, um, to really a very easy checklist is that those five elements and are you, are you creating decisions in your practices? Are you giving your kids repetitions um, that aren't exactly the same every time? Does it look like a game? Are they playing? Can they compete? How do I make this fun for our kids? If we can, if we can educate our coaches on how to do that, we're going to have, create more fun experiences for our players. And I know with, um, with USA Hockey and our coaching education program, that is a huge focus is, is just educating our coaches on what fun is and how do you create it as a coach? Okay, thank you. We have Farzat is back in the room. Uh, Farzat, do you have another question or are you okay? Uh, thank you so much. I, I just I just wanted to uh, apologize for the for the connection problem. I didn't get the answer, but I will ask the the other uh, fellows that were joined. But uh, sorry again for the connection problem. This is this is a usual thing in my country. <laughs> No worries at all. And if you, if you have any other questions um, afterwards, feel free to, to email me or reach out to me. We can have a conversation. Thank you so much. And then last question is a quite interesting question. How do coaches realize that they are letting the players to have too much fun? Yeah, well, it depends. So it's the, uh, what, is, what is the goal of your practice, right? Or what is the goal of your activity? And are the kids on task? And so, again, it's really about creating that environment that focuses their attention. And so if you notice that they are, if a lot of times when I hear they're having too much fun, that means that they're probably not on task or they're off over to the side goofing off. 
Um, that's something that typically happens when they're not engaged in the activity. So if you have really long lines and they get to play for you know 15 to 20 seconds, but then they have to stand in line for a minute and a minute and a half to, in order to go again, that time that they spend in line is usually when they're they're over there, you know, like Johan mentioned at the beginning, the eight-year-olds hitting each other in the head with the stick, right? So it's really about making sure that your players are engaged and they're on task with what it is that you're trying to accomplish in your activity or your practice. And so it really comes back to, like Johan mentioned, the constraints-led approach and, and really focusing on, on what kind of an environment are we creating. And in having those conversations with kid, kids, okay, let's, all right, let's focus, get back on task here. Uh, then we get a question and we, because we have to wrap up, do we, sh should we create a tracker uh, to follow up the coaches practice and player development? Uh, that's a great question. And that's something that uh, the study that Amanda did, um, the, the methodology that she used, this concept mapping, it lends itself to survey development. And so in the third year of that study, we, um, we piloted a tool to actually measure how much fun our kids having. So we asked them, you know, all of those, those 81 determinants, how important are each one of these to, to, to you? And then how often are they happening? And so that, that, is, um, that study is, once there's funding again, uh, we'll hopefully get more uh, data to, to validate that, that tool. <clears throat> but in the meantime, having those, asking your, your kids those questions, right? So how much fun are you having? Or how important are each of these things to, to your fun experience? And how often do you think they're happening or happening? And that's a really quick and easy way as a coach, you can start to gauge, okay, well, they're saying that this is way more fun to them, but it's not happening very often. Okay, well, maybe I need to you know, focus on this area a little bit more in, in my practice development. Um, but it really comes back to asking the kids what it is that they want. And, and I, I truly believe that if you have data to support uh, whatever actions you're, you're moving forward with as a coach, then that's something to, uh, that, that gives you a little bit more um, comfortability to, to know that you're making the right decision moving forward. Thank you. To conclude, we have one more and can we unmute Chamba? Chamba, my friend, you can ask your question yourself. <laughs> Where is Chamba? The question is like, it does fun Hello. Hello. Yes, Jamba. Does fun for kids have to be in sync with fun for parents and coaches for good results? If yes, how do we achieve it? Because fun, I think, is very subjective. Yeah, and I think that's where you know, asking your asking your team specifically, what is it that they they find fun, and then how do we create that as as parents and, and coaches is the easiest and quickest way of doing that. Um, I think that again, it if we if we're really focused on creating a player centered environment, right? If we want kids to keep coming back, if we want to do the best thing for kids. How do we maintain them at the center of all of our decisions? And so when you say, you know, is it important that parents, players, and coaches are all on the same page when it comes to creating that fun experience, that's the best way to make sure that, that they are. So asking the kids, what is it that they find fun? You know, you can ask the parents and coaches, what do you think is fun for, for your kids? And if you see that there's a disconnect, let's try to get everybody on the same page because again, it's just like a, you know, a train moving in the same direction. If we can get everybody going, you know, going in the same direction, you go with a lot more force and momentum moving forward. Okay, thank you. We have some more questions, but we will, we will answer those questions by chat because we have to conclude this session. Thank you, Heather, for your presentation and energy. May I say it was great fun. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you all for your time and attention. Hope you will start using the fun maps in your daily work. And as said, if you have more questions, just send them to us. We will reply all of them, uh, no problem. 
Next skill for all will be on May 5th. So we will reflect on the three-on-three -three Youth Olympic game format as we used in Lausanne. Thank you and see you next time.